Good evening and welcome. I'm your host, Mr. Adams. On tonight's video, we shall be discussing five people who disappeared mysteriously in the 1990s. Let's begin. Sarah McDermott Sarah McDermott was a 23-year-old woman who disappeared from Cananook Railway Station in Melbourne, Australia on the 11th of July, 1990. McDermott had been playing tennis after work with two friends at what was then known as Flinders Park in Batman Avenue, East Melbourne, before walking to Richmond Station, where they found that they had just missed a Frankston Line train. They caught a train to Caulfield, then changed to a Frankston service. McDermott's friends disembarked a train at Bond Beach while she remained continuing on to Cananook Station, where her vehicle was parked. She was last seen alighting the train and heading for the poorly lit car park at approximately 10.20pm. Police suspected that McDermott had been assaulted based on bloodstains found beneath her red 1978 Honda Civic, which was abandoned in the station car park. Also, they found drag marks leading into the bushes, as well as finding a cigarette lighter on the ground belonging to Sarah, but no trace of her was found. Later, witnesses said Sarah got off the train and crossed the footbridge to the car park, where some people heard a woman shouting, Give me back my keys. A 21-day extensive air, sea and land search with more than 250 police produced no results. A later appeal for information led to two witnesses report that they had also heard a woman exclaim, Give me back my keys. In May 2006, an inquest held by coroner Ian West found McDermott had met her death as a result of foul play, but the exact circumstances were unknown. An initial state government reward of $50,000 was increased after an additional $75,000 was offered by an anonymous benefactor. This was then increased to $1 million in 2004 and remains current. In 2010, marking the 20th anniversary of McDermott's disappearance, her family also announced that they had created a website, Not Alone, which was designed to help other families who find themselves in a position similar to them. Please use the anniversary to issue a new call for information on the case. They stated, You do not close the books on these sorts of crimes. History proves that if you continue to communicate with people out there, in Victoria, in Australia, in the world in some cases, that piece of information, that key, will come forward and we'll solve it. In 2011, convicted Australian serial killer Paul Denyer was interviewed by police and denied any involvement in McDermott's disappearance. Sarah McDermott is still missing. Thomas Dean Gibson Thomas Gibson is an American child who vanished from his front yard in Oregon under mysterious circumstances. On the morning of March 18, 1991, Larry Gibson, Thomas's father, who was also a sheriff's deputy of Douglas County, prepared to leave for a jog at approximately 11.30am. Larry claimed that before leaving the property, he attempted to shoot a stray cat but missed. His son Thomas, aged two, was playing in the yard of the home at the time. According to Larry, he resumed his jog and was gone from the family's home for approximately 45 minutes. Upon returning, he discovered his son was missing. Shortly after realising Thomas was missing, Larry and his wife Judith phoned police. Larry was notified not to report for duty that day, though there were accounts of him having left the family property in uniform for approximately 25 minutes during the initial search. According to Larry, his four-year-old daughter Karen claimed that they had witnessed an unidentified couple pull into the family's driveway and abduct Thomas, and he wanted to search a nearby rest area for any signs of Thomas or the couple. Per the witness description, the unidentified couple consisted of a blonde Caucasian woman and a dark-haired Caucasian man, driving an older model gold or tan truck. Though Larry's patrol car was not initially searched, it was subsequently discovered that its odometer had registered seven miles that were unaccounted for on the day of Thomas' disappearance. Larry explained that the unaccounted miles were registered when he drove to the nearby rest area searching for Thomas. Within the first weeks of the investigation, Larry became the prime suspect in his son's disappearance. In 1992, Larry Gibson resigned from his position as the Douglas County Sheriff's Deputy, and he and his wife Judy relocated to Avon, Montana after giving birth to another child, daughter Lisa. However, the couple separated in 1993, and Judy returned with the children to Oregon. Larry remained in Montana while he worked as an insurance agent in Townsend. Gibson was arrested in Townsend, Montana on April 14, 1994. 
charged with second degree murder in Thomas's death. He was arrested after the eldest Gibson daughter, Karen, aged four at the time of Thomas' disappearance, told investigators that she witnessed her father beat Thomas before placing him inside his patrol car on the day of his disappearance. She had previously told detectives she witnessed two strangers abduct Thomas. According to prosecutors, Larry Gibson had also made inconsistent statements regarding Thomas' disappearance. He was extradited to Oregon later that month, pending trial. Laddie Gibson's trial commenced on January the 18th, 1995. In late February 1995, Laddie Gibson's half-sister Debbie provided testimony against him, stating that after Thomas went missing, she received a frantic phone call from him in which he confessed to killing Thomas, and telling her he may need money to post bail after his arrest. Debbie also claimed that when Karen and her mother, Judy, stayed with her at their home in Iowa after Thomas's disappearance, she made a comment regarding being frightened about her father putting her in a big hole like he had with Thomas. During this same day, Judy alleged that Karen first told her that she had witnessed Larry beating Thomas outside on the day he disappeared. Karen was the prosecutor's star witness in the case and testified against her father over the course of the six-week trial. The defence suggested that Karen had been influenced to adopt the storyline that her father had beaten and killed Thomas by her mother. Court documents prepared by the district attorney presented the series events as follows. Larry Gibson left the family's residence at approximately 11.30am to go for a jog. Thomas followed after his father, who instructed him to wait for his sister to come out of the house. Spotting a cat nearby, Larry purportedly used a pistol to kill it, assuming it to be a stray. When Thomas curiously approached the dead cat, Larry angrily picked him up and carried him to the family's carport, where he proceeded to slap the child in the face multiple times. After realising that Karen had observed Larry hitting Thomas from the window, he placed Thomas in his patrol car and drove it behind a wood pile on the property, where he placed the child's body in a plastic bag and hid it in the trunk of his vehicle. It was theorised by investigators that after volunteer searchers began looking for Thomas, Larry took the child's body and disposed of it in an area known as Swamp Creek, though his remains were not recovered. Karen claimed that her father threatened her against telling authorities what she had witnessed, and felt unsafe to do so until her mother separated from him and they relocated back to Oregon in 1994. In March 1995, Larry Gibson was convicted of the manslaughter of Thomas, though he proclaimed innocence throughout and after the trial. His conviction called for 15 to 18 months imprisonment, of which he had served 12 while being in police custody, leading up to and during his trial. He was released from prison in 1996. Following Larry Gibson's release from prison, he started a web page in 2001 regarding Thomas' disappearance and asking the public for help in finding his son. Thomas Gibson is still missing to this day. Richard James Edwards Richard Edwards, also known as Ricky James or Ricky Manic, was a Welsh musician who was the lyricist and rhythm guitarist of the alternative rock band Manic Street Preachers. Edwards disappeared on the 1st of February 1995, on the day he was due to fly to the United States on a promotional tour. In the two weeks before his disappearance, Edwards withdrew £200 a day from his bank account, which totaled £2,800 by the day of the scheduled flight. Some speculated that he needed the money for the US trip, and it was also mentioned that he had ordered a new desk for his flat from a shop in Cardiff. However, there were no records of the desk having been paid for, and this would have explained only half of the money withdrawn. According to reports, the night before he disappeared, Edwards gave a friend a book called Novel with Cocaine, instructing her to read the instructions which detailed the author staying in a mental asylum before vanishing. While staying at the Embassy Hotel in Bayswater Road, London, Edwards removed some books and videos from his bag, then wrapped them carefully in a box with a note that said I love you, then decorated the box like a birthday present. The package was addressed to Edwards' on and off girlfriend Jo, whom he had met some years prior although they had split a few weeks earlier. The next morning, Edwards collected his wallet, car keys and some Prozac and his passport. He reportedly checked out of the hotel at 7am, leaving his toiletries, packed suitcase and some of his Prozac. He then drove to his flat in Cardiff, leaving behind his passport, his Prozac and the Severin Bridge Tolbooth receipt. In the two weeks that followed, Edward was apparently spotted in the Newport Passport Office and at Newport Bus Station by a fan 
who was unaware that he was missing. The fan reported that they had discussed a mutual friend before Edwards departed. On the 7th of February, a taxi driver from Newport supposedly picked up Edwards from the King's Hotel and drove him around the valleys, including Edwards' hometown of Blackwood. The driver reported that the passenger had spoken with a Cockney accent, which occasionally slipped into a Welsh one, and that he had asked if he could lie down on the back seat. Eventually, they reached Blackwood and the bus station, but the passenger reportedly said, this is not the place, and asked to be taken to Pontypool Railway Station. The passenger got out at the Severn View service station and paid the £68 fare in cash. On the 14th of February, Edward's Vauxhall Cavalier received a parking ticket at the Severn View service station, and on the 17th of February, the vehicle was reported as abandoned. Police discovered the battery to be dead, with evidence that the car had been lived in. The car also had photos that he had taken of his family days prior. Due to the service station's proximity to the Severn Bridge, a known suicide site, it was widely believed that Edwards had jumped from the bridge. Many people who knew Edwards, however, had said that he was never the type to contemplate suicide, and he himself was quoted in 1994 as saying, in terms of the S word, that does not enter my mind, and it never has done in terms of an attempt, because I'm stronger than that, I might be a weak person, but I can take pain. Since then, Edwards has reportedly been spotted in a market in India and on the islands of Fortaventura and Lanzarote. There have been other alleged sightings of Edwards, especially in the years immediately following his disappearance. However, none of these have proved conclusive and none have been confirmed by investigators. In 2018, it was revealed that the bridge's toll receipt was a 24-hour clock, meaning he would have crossed the bridge at 2.55am rather than 2.55pm as previously thought for 23 years. The investigation itself has received criticism. In his 1999 book, Everything, a book about Manic Street Preachers, Simon Price states that aspects of the investigation were far from satisfactory. He asserts that the police may not have taken Edward's mental state into account when prioritising his disappearance, and also records Edward's sister Rachel as having hit out at police handling after CCTV footage was analysed two years after Edward's vanished. Price records a member of the investigation team as stating that the idea that you could identify identify someone from that is nonsense. While his family had the option of declaring him legally dead from 2002 onwards, they chose not to for many years, and his status remained open as a missing person, until the 23rd of November 2008, when he became officially presumed dead. However, as of time of recording, Edwards has never been found. Kirsten Dennis Smart Kirsten Smart is an American woman who is presumed to have been abducted and killed at the end of her freshman year of college on May 25, 1996, while on the campus of California's Polytechnic State University. On the night she disappeared, which fell on Memorial Day weekend, Smart attended a birthday party for a fellow student. At approximately 2am on May 25, 1996, she was found passed out on a neighbour's lawn by two fellow students, Cheryl Anderson and Tim Davis, who both had just left the party. They helped Smart to her feet and decided to walk her back to her nearby dormitory. Another student from the party, Paul Flores, joined their group and offered to help the two return Smart to her dorm room safely. Davis departed the group first since he lived off campus and had driven to the party. Anderson, who was second to depart the group after she told Flores that he could walk Smart back to her dorm, since he lived closer. Flores stated to police that he walked Smart as far as his dormitory and then allowed her to walk back to her Muir Hall dorm by herself. This was the last known sighting of her. She did not have any money or credit cards at the time she went missing. The University Police Department originally suspected that Smart had gone on an unannounced vacation, as was common among students over the holidays, and as a result were slow in reporting her as a missing person to the local law enforcement. During the Lacey Peterson murder investigation, there was unfounded rumours in the media that Lacey's husband, Scott Peterson, had something to do with Smart's disappearance, due to them both being in attendance at the Cal Poly campus. There was a brief initial inquiry into whether Peterson was tied to the disappearance, with Peterson denying any involvement, and he was eventually ruled out as a suspect by police. Smart's disappearance remains an unsolved case, although compelling evidence was discovered that points to Paul Flores knowing what happened to her, 
Although her body was never discovered, Smart's bloody earring was found by a tenant at the former residence of Paul Flores' mother. This earring has since been lost by police, and between 1996 and 2007, various searches for her remains and other evidence were conducted, some using police dogs trained to detect the scent of human remains, including searches of properties owned by Flores' family. No useful leads were found for nearly two decades. On September 6, 2016, officials from the SLO County Sheriff's Office announced they were investigating a new lead in the case. Cadaver dogs from the FBI were brought in and investigators were preparing to spend approximately four days excavating an area of the Cal Poly campus. After three days, items were found at all three dig sites located on the same hillside near Smart's dorm. A spokesman for the sheriff's office said the items are being analysed to see whether they are connected to the case, which could take days, weeks or months. The items uncovered are still being investigated as of 2020. On January on January 18, 2020, the Stockton Record reported that the FBI informed Smart's family that additional news about her disappearance would be coming and the family might want to get away for a while, but did not provide any specific information. However, on January 22, 2020, the Record issued a correction. The FBI did not contact the Smart family, rather a retired FBI agent who had been in contact with the family for years was the source of the advice. On January 29, the police department confirmed that two trucks owned by Flores had been taken in as evidence. On February the 5th, 2020, search warrants were served for specific items of evidence at four different locations. Flores was briefly detained during the search. On April the 22nd, 2020, Los Angeles Times reported that a search warrant was served at the homes of Paul Flores in San Pedro, California. The Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department assisted detectives from the SLO County Sheriff's Department in the search. It was reported that numerous items of interest were successfully found during the search. The SLO County Sheriff is now continuing the investigation but no further public information is available at this time. Ruth Wilson Ruth Wilson is a British teenager from Betchworth near Dorking in Surrey, England who disappeared on the 27th of November 1995. On the Saturday before her disappearance, Wilson worked her usual job in a music shop in Dorking, then went for a meal with her ex-boyfriend Will Kennedy and another friend Neil Philipson. Kennedy and Philipson both stated that Wilson paid for the meal and told them it would be something to remember her by. Wilson then went for handbell practice at the local church on Sunday, then went to a youth group in Dorking, then back to Kennedy's for supper. His mother gave her some old clothing. Wilson's parents left early for work on the day of her disappearance, leaving Wilson and her sister Jenny to catch the school bus. At the last moment, Wilson told Jenny that she wasn't going with her on the bus. Jenny wasn't surprised as Wilson was in the sixth form and didn't always come in for the whole day, though she was surprised that her sister left it so late to tell her before the arrival of the bus. Shortly after Jenny left for school, Kennedy appeared with his car and offered Ruth a lift. She declined, saying she would meet up later. She did not attend school at all that day. At around 11.30am, Wilson took a taxi into Dorkin. Around midday, she ordered flowers for her stepmother from the Thistles Florist at 257 Dorkin High Street. Wilson asked that they would not be delivered until the following Wednesday. Wilson then spent the afternoon in Dorkin Library. Around 4pm, she took a taxi from Dorkin Railway Station to Box Hill. She was dropped off on a bridgeway a short way from the Hand in Hand pub, now the Box Tree on Box Hill. The taxi driver stated that Wilson displayed unusual behaviour in that she simply stood still in the rain as he drove off. Off. This was notable as the taxi driver observed that people typically walk away after they've been dropped off. In other reports, the taxi driver stated that Ruth appeared to be looking around for someone. The taxi driver was the last person to see her at 4.30pm. At the time of her disappearance, Ruth was wearing a red knitted jumper, black velvet trousers, black pixie boots and a small lady's watch on her left wrist. She had a small blue duffel bag with a personal stereo and tapes. Liam McCauley, a 58-year-old retired police officer investigating the disappearance, observed that Wilson was dressed as if she was going into another car, implying that a third party may have been involved and running away seemed more likely than suicide. McCauley also stated that disappearing completely would be very difficult. Wilson disappeared 14 days before the 13th anniversary of her mother's death. That night, Surrey police organised a search for Wilson with a helicopter, police dogs and heat-seeking equipment. They searched the Box Hill area but found no solid clues as to her whereabouts. It was subsequently discovered that she frequently went to Box Hill after school. She was also concerned about her performance at school and had kept a school report from her parents that weekend. 
On the 29th of November, two days after her disappearance, the flowers ordered by Wilson were delivered to her stepmother Karen. The flowers were described by Ian Wilson as an expensive bouquet in subsequent reports. There was no notes attached to the flowers. On Friday the 1st of December, four days after her disappearance, as reported in the Times newspaper, police found three notes hidden under a bush in the undergrowth at the top edge of Betchworth Quarry on Box Hill. The notes amounted to a farewell to her parents, her best friend and a teenage boy she knew. Nearby were found empty packets of paracetamol tablets and a half empty bottle of alcohol. The police have never divulged the contents of the notes to the public. On Saturday the 2nd of December, five days after her disappearance, a large-scale search was organised by the police and fire and rescue services, which involved 60 volunteers. The search utilised a police helicopter, tracker dogs and thermal imaging equipment. Mark Williams Thomas, who was the family liaison officer for Wilson's case, stated that extensive searches across Box Hill had yielded no evidence to suggest she was killed or committed suicide. He also stated he was sure Wilson was not abducted by a stranger. From the experience I have had, I would suggest one of two things occurred. She either went up there to meet someone and has subsequently gone away, or she went there and died in some way. On Friday the 8th of December 1995, Ian and Karen Wilson appeared on the Granada TV breakfast programme this morning to appeal for information. They stated they believed that Ruth was still alive but afraid to come home. Surrey police have stated that the investigation would be reopened if any new evidence or lines of inquiry came to light. In 2018, a local newspaper sent out an appeal to anyone who would have known Wilson at the time to come forward with information that could shed light on the disappearance. Ruth Wilson has still not been found. I've been your host, Mr Adams. Good night.